Okay, we are all back. So we had some conversations in our breakout rooms around what's the what is Baldwin doing with the song that he's playing in Jesse's head? Um, what's the significance of Jesse's childhood friend Otis? And what stood out to you most about James Baldwin's writing style? Uh, who wants to share what was discussed in the breakout room? Yasmin, what was discussed in your guys' breakout room? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we discussed in our breakout room, like, I was confused on something because he, like, I was confused on something, so I asked him, like, is he white or, like, or is he, like, I was confused because, well, who's he? What's he? Jesse or? Uh, I think Jesse. Okay. So I was confused because he talks about how uh, white men are this and how uh, <clears throat> black people, <clears throat> sorry, I'm kind of sick. And how, like, I was so confused because first he talks about he's married with this woman. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about how he kind of like, has a little hatred towards um, black people and how he thinks black people are trying to send white men to hell. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of confused, like, oh, so he's white or? Did your group answer your question? Um, not like, I didn't really understand it still, like they clarified it somewhat, but still I couldn't understand. Okay. Um, so let's do this, Yasmin. I'm, let me go through my notes and then we'll circle back to you to see if, whatever confusion that you have is still part confusing points. And then if so, we'll clarify that. Um, but, but we'll, um, I'll make sure to kind of spend some time to make sure that you're not still confused. Um, who else? What was discussed in your guys' breakout room? We could talk about the writing style. We could talk about Otis. We could talk about the song, any of that's on the table. Uh, well, we discussed Otis being uh, Jesse's childhood friend, showing that he, you know, wasn't racist un until his father, you know, sort of pounded it into him and obviously took him to this, I guess, lynching party and, uh, he, you know, I guess reconverted or he was mesmerized. And, and, uh, but so that's a flashback and, and he, he gets he becomes a cop. Uh, later on, so just that whole thing about Baldwin putting him in the police state, mm. um, setting that up. Yeah. Um, I like how you put, like, he was patterned, right? You, you didn't use taught, um, but pattern, I think, is a very good way of understanding how this um, ideology of racism gets passed down. Um, one more. What about Baldwin's writing style? Nicole, what did you guys talk about in your breakout rooms? Um, well, I didn't really talk just because my background was loud, but I was listening and they were and I agreed with Cassandra because she was mentioning how his writing is really harsh in a way. Mm. Like it's very like he uses it makes like in like it was it's kind of uncomfortable as well. The way he uses like I don't know um he talks about how his wife isn't enough for him like he needs a little bit more spice so he got he goes out there and like picks them up mm -hmm. and stuff so that's kind of like the way that he is like I don't know it makes it's like kind of like uncomfortable and stuff okay. and, uh, Nicole mentioned Cassandra's because Cassandra if you don't mind could you kind of speak a little bit to your thoughts on Baldwin's writing style yeah, we mentioned that um, his style, he uses a lot of violence. Um, I also noticed that he writes from the perspective of an inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. 
So he gives us like that inner perspective, like the thought, like sort of like a thought process. Um, and to write, to write from like a white man's perspective, uh, I think that gives us like a very honest sense of, uh, you know, of, of like thought processes in, in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think Baldwin taking on the white gaze and writing from the white gaze is very interesting. He, that's something that not a lot of black writers do. And Baldwin is kind of known for taking up that task. In fact, there's a, a book that he wrote entitled Giovanni's Room, where he's writing a whole novel from a perspective of a white protagonist. And, and he really plays with the idea of this system of racism, not only ill impacting black folks, but more importantly, in an ill impacting white folks as well. So that's a really good call, call out, Cassandra. Um, I ask that you all get a pencil and paper. I, I need you guys to take down um, these notes because I'm going to provide you your final theoretical framework for the semester. And this will tie directly into your midterm, which we'll have in about two to three weeks. Um, so we know we have two theoretical frameworks already. The first one being African-American male theory, which states that African people are resistant and resilient with an innate capacity for brilliance. The second theoretical framework is funds of knowledge, um, which states that knowledge gets passed down from generation to generation, speaking to a culture's uniqueness and allowing a culture to understand their place in the world. That knowledge is often goes unrecognized in dominant culture. Your third and final theoretical framework, it comes from critical race theory. So the theory is critical race theory. Um, the framework or the tenet is counter storytelling. So it's critical race theory is the theory, the framework is the counter storytelling. And counter storytelling is just telling stories and narratives focused on the perspective of those who are marginalized, those who are oppressed, and those who are othered. So if we're gonna tell the story of American discovery, we're not gonna tell that story from the vantage point of Christopher Columbus. We're gonna tell that story from the vantage points of the indigenous people who were here already, or from the vantage point of the Africans who were on that ship, helping Columbus find his way to the West, right? So this is this idea of counter storytelling. If we're gonna use the examples of the protest around the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, two summers ago, we're going to talk about that circumstance from the standpoint, not of the police, of the um, of the mayors of the cities, of the store owners, right? We're going to tell that story from the standpoint of the protesters, from the standpoint of the family of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and from the standpoint of maybe George Floyd or Breonna Taylor themselves, right? So this is idea of counter storytelling. Does anyone need me to further explain counter storytelling? I'm going to go over the first one again, but does anyone need me to further explain counter storytelling? Okay, so the first one is African American male theory, African American male theory, which states African people are resistant and resilient with an innate capacity for brilliance. African people are resistant and resilient with an innate capacity for brilliance. That's your first counter, I'm sorry, your first uh, theoretical framework. Uh, you'll get a study guide after next week and it'll have these theoretical frameworks on them. Uh, we'll spend a day just going over the study guide and, and familiarizing yourselves with these frameworks. Okay, so you have that. We'll be spending two weeks with James Baldwin. So another thing that's important when understanding the work of James Baldwin is what I call the Baldwinian pillars of white inferiority. And we know that when I say white inferiority, I'm using that in place of this idea of white supremacy, right? So if they're the Baldwinian pillars of white inferiority, I ask you, what does a pillar do? What is the work that pillars seek to do? Pillar. If you're building this building and you have it, go ahead. A foundation, set a foundation. Set a foundation, absolutely. Set a foundation, serve as support or to hold something up, okay? So what we're talking about is the foundation, the support, the things that uphold 
this idea, this notion, this philosophy, this ideology of white inferiority, okay? One of them is the white imagination. The other, the second one, is the maintenance of white innocence, maintaining the innocence of whiteness or white people, okay? So we have the white imagination and the maintenance of white innocence. So for me, when I conceptualize this idea or this notion of the white imagination, I can think of no quintessential depiction of the white imagination other than Hollywood, right? Because what are, what are movies other than the imaginations, the fantasies, the desires, the fears of white men? Because by and large, Hollywood movies are produced by white men. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, with that being said, who has heard of the film Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith? Anybody familiar with that film? Uh, so Serena, can you kind of speak to what is going on in the film Birth of a Nation, please? I haven't actually seen it, but I've heard about it. I know it's like considered like one of the most like racist movies ever. Yeah, and not only is it the most racist movie ever, but is widely recognized as classic American cinema. So I took a film school, a film class in junior college. I took a film class at Cal State LA. In both of those courses, the first film that we watched was Birth of a Nation. They say that this is a film that was ahead of its time technically because of the way that it was shot, because the cameras that was used, and just the way that the film was produced was far ahead of its time. So they study this film for its technical aspects. But to Serena's point, the subject matter of the film, okay? This film was went on tour throughout the whole United States and it was played in the White House for a period for months, okay? And Serena says the most racist film ever produced in America. That's saying a lot for America. But let's get to the subject matter. So the setting is reconstruction, it's post-Civil War, it's a southern town. And due to reconstruction, which allows the blacks in this town to vote, black folks are occupying political office. And the way that D.W. Griffins depicts this is he has these black folks in the, the, the political offices feet up on the desk, which I find ironic seeing what happened on January 6th, um, had them eating watermelon, had them eating fried chicken, just these very racist stereotypical tropes of blackness, okay? So while this is going on in the political office, in the town itself, black men are running rampant, raping white women. So much so that as a white woman is trying to escape her rapist, she throws herself off of a cliff. Now, one tidbit of information, there are no black actors or actresses in the film. They're all, anyone who is depicted as black is played by a white individual wearing blackface, okay? So because of the political climate, because of these rapid rapes that are going on throughout the town, the Ku Klux Klan is birthed and they are brought in to run out the black folks and set order to the town. They're insinuating the birth of the nation where the racial dynamics are set in place, okay? So this is the, song, this is the film that's widely recognized as the greatest film in American cinema. It's a classic, it's ahead of its time. Again, it goes on tour throughout the whole United States and it's played in the White House. But I circle you back to the white imagination. This film displays the fears of white folks, right? The raping of their women, black people having political power, right? But then it also expresses their desires, right? The Ku Klux Klan rises and it places everything all order in place. Um, I'm not a Star Wars fan. I don't really watch that. I haven't even, never seen a whole movie but I do know that when the heroes of Star Wars come in to like save the day or whatever, there's a song that plays, right? Now that song that's playing in Star Wars is the same exact song that D.W. Griffith chooses to play when the Ku Klux Klan rise into town and runs out all the blacks, right? So if you think about the timing of the Birth of a Nation in Star Wars, we know that Birth of a Nation predates Star Wars, but is it John Lucas, I think, that does Star Wars? He chooses to use the very same song to show rights being wrongs being made right. Found that interesting. 
So the white imagination, right? The other pillar is the maintenance of white innocence. Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ezekiel, George Floyd, Ezekiel Ford, um, Sandra Bland, Emmett Till, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all, right? These are all names of individuals who occupied black bodies who had their lives snatched by the white power structure. In all those circumstances, both them John, right? The perpetrator, the murderer, goes before a trial of their, a jury of their peers, right? And this is important because it's their peers. It's not the community who is the victim of their acts, but it's their peers, right? And by and large, the jury finds these perpetrators not guilty due to justifiable homicide. Justifiable homicide. So the murder that they caused, the homicide that they enacted, is justifiable. Tell me why does these homicides, why are they deemed justifiable? Because in, and in every one of those circumstances, there's a common thread that's articulated that allows these homicides to be justifiable. What is that common thread? What do they all say? Anybody know? That they are in fear of their life at some point. Bing, that's it. So, what's that motherfucker? George Zimmerman, right? He can enact the Stound Your Ground Law because Trayvon Martin posed as a threat. Because of the size and stature of George Floyd and Eric Garner, the chokehold and the knee is permissible because those officers feared for their life. Now, for those who work in this class, right, I ask you a question. Before you started that job and when you filled out that application, were you provided a job description, responsibilities of the duty, and the criteria to fulfill that role? Was that provided for you when you filled out the application before you got the job? Yes or no? Okay, yes. When you, before you started that job, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a serious, I'm sorry, there's a, a period of training that you go through before you're placed into doing that role, correct? Serena, you said they don't, you didn't get no job description for your job? No. What, what do you do? <laughs> uh, I'm a, a home care aide. Okay. But that, that may be why. Um, but, but for the most part, right, you, you're going to get that description and you're going to get that training, right? So let's think about what we're talking about here. These police officers, they sign up for this job knowing what the dangers of the job are, right? They go through training. They received they receive um, tactical training. So if they engage in combat, they know how to defend themselves. They also train, receive training around their ammunitions, on their, around their firearms, right? They're, provi they're provided with um, tactical gear to keep them safe, right? Bulletproof vest, riot gear at times, handcuffs, pepper spray, batons, tasers, firearms, right? So you know what you're getting into. You're trained for what you're going to do right? You have the equipment for what you're trying to do. But for some strange reason, whenever you're confronted with a Black man unarmed, Black woman unarmed, or a Black child unarmed, right? There's this fear that comes over you and you just have to knee jerk, grab your gun. Even if you meant to grab your taser, you could grab your gun. And the fear is so understood that it makes this homicide justifiable. Your drunk ass could go to the wrong floor of your apartment, kick in the door of somebody watching TV and eating ice cream, kill them, and because you think it's your home, it's justifiable. Because the man jumped up off his couch, because you kicked the door into his house, right? He poses as a threat, which makes this justifiable. Here's the tricky part, though, because it's not only the police that say the fear is justified, right? the jury of their peers also agree that that individual posed a threat. Why is that? 
because they watch the same movies as the police. They see the same news flashes as the police. They hear the same music as the police. So this white imagination is so pervasive in our society that we don't even question this notion of black people being a threat. It's accepted as true without any critical thought because we all are falling victim to the white imagination through entertainment, movies, media, music, etc. right? So this is how the white imagination and white, the maintenance of white innocence work hand in hand to uphold this system that we call white inferiority. Does that make sense? Does anyone need me to further explain how this comes into play? Because this is important when you engage the work of Baldwin. All right. So let's talk about how this plays out within the story of Jesse. So we know Baldwin as a descriptive writer. He like he does what I like to call he displaces you. So he'll take you off of your couch in Claremont and drop you in the home of this southern man in his bedroom. You see that he's restless, he can't sleep, right? His wife is laying next to him, so naturally he's trying to get it cracking. Right? It's a great way to fall asleep. But what's on his mind is preventing him from performing the act. He can't bring his little man to attention because his mind is elsewhere, right? So he thinks about the happenings of his day. He thinks about the town that he's a sheriff in and the civil unrest that he's forced to quell with the black folks in his town arguing, protesting, and advocating for their rights to vote, right? He goes back to this incident in the cell where he has to cataprog the leader of the group, kicks him in the face, right? And I found it interesting the way that Baldwin writes that encounter. And I found it as a, a great example of the maintenance of white innocence. So, uh, there it goes. So he says, Baldwin writes, his foot leapt out. He had not known it was going to and caught the boy flush in the jaw, right? So he just kicked the kid in the face, but it leaped, it leapt out, right? And he didn't even know that it was going to do so, right? He's still innocent. It's not malicious. It's not intentional. It's a knee jerk reaction, right? And as he thinks about this, this song is reverberating in his head. He thinks about the song. He thinks about those who are singing the song. And he says, they were singing to God. They were singing for mercy and they hoped to go to heaven. Naturally, because they're sinners, right? They're the ones who are causing all the issues. So they're singing to get themselves into heaven, right? And he, being Jesse, had even sometimes felt when looking into the eyes of some of the old women, and a few of the old men that they were singing for the mercy of his soul too, right? But we know, um, as Jelani pointed out earlier, that something a little more deeper is going on with this song, right? And then he continues. He, being Jesse, had never thought much about what it meant to be a good person. He tried to be a good person and treat everybody right, it wasn't his fault, again, his innocence, right? It wasn't his fault if the niggers had taken it to their heads to fight against God and go against the rules laid down in the Bible for everyone to read, right? So again, I'm innocent. I'm only doing these things because these people choose to go against the will of God and not follow the rules laid down by the Bible, which is causing me to force my hand. Right? This is my duty as the sheriff of the town to maintain law and order. I'm innocent, right? Um, and then Otis thinks about Otis. And on page 243, Baldwin writes, he being Jesse, had grown accustomed for the solution of such mysteries to go to Otis. He felt that Otis knew everything, but could not ask Otis about this. Anyway, he had not seen Otis for two days. He had not seen a black face anywhere for two days, right? So he had the questions about 
race. He has a question about things that are going on in the town. And when he asks questions about race, he asks Otis, right? So let me ask you, what is this? One second. What's up? What's up? What's up? Hurry up. What? Good night. No, not right now. I'm in class. I'm in class. Um, okay. So let me ask you. If Jesse goes to Otis to understand racial dynamics, what does it say about the conversation that's going on in Jesse's home about race and the conversation that's going on in Otis's home about race? What does that say? Let me ask it another way. Who do you think knows more about race? Otis or Jesse? Otis. Why, Jelani? Well, Jesse's not getting any questions answered by his father. He, you know, he, and he's asking about everything. He's just being ignored and, uh, you know, just being shown, saying, you know, just wait, wait, you'll, 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 one day you'll learn, or you're going to learn now. But let me show you. Juxtaposed to Otis, right? Because remember, Jesse goes to Otis to get the answers, right? So let me ask you guys, what's going on in Otis's house to make him so aware of racial dynamics? What's going on in Otis's home to make him understand racial dynamics? Nobody? This is one of the bifurcations in American society, right? Because all households have the talk, white households, black households. In white households, the talk is the birds and the bees, right? In black households, the talk is how to perform when you're engaged the police, what to do when you encounter a racist situation, right? Why is that? Why are those conversations different? My son just burst in the room right now. He's five. So probably eight years, if I'm lucky, probably more realistically, six to seven years, I'm going to have to have that talk with him, right? And what that talk is intended to do is to give my son a little bit of information that when he leaves my house to go out through his day, that he's able to return home in one piece. His survival is dependent on him having understandings of how race works. Jesse, he, it's okay for him not to know because Jesse won't be lynched. If you notice, the whole black town, all the blacks in that town was ghosts. They ain't seen him for two weeks because the blacks knew that they could be an unintended consequence of what's taking place up on that hill. Their survival depended on the fact that they know how to navigate racism. But Jesse is learning about race in a, in a way, right? Does anyone know what the etymology of the, of the word picnic is? When I say etymology, it just means the origin, the original meaning of picnic. Does anyone know what the original meaning of picnic is? Fortunately, I do, yeah. Yeah, I think because of our age, Jelani, but go ahead. Can you yeah. let us know what that means, please? It means it was, uh, the etymology is from pick a nigga. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Like yep. A, pick a nigga. Yep, pick a nigga and hang him. That's the original picnic, right? So we go back to Baldwin on page 241, and he says, is that where they got him now? Asked Jesse's father. By this time, there were three cars piled behind the first one, with everyone looking excited and shiny. And Jesse noticed that they were carrying food. It was like a 4th of July picnic, right? Quite literally, okay? As Jesse's observing the happenings, right, there's a question that is prevalent in his head. He asks it to himself at least three times because you know his parents aren't giving him any answers. What did he do? What did he do? 
what did he do, right? So in other words, he had to do something to deserve this treatment. It's inconceivable that my mom, my dad, their friends are so inhumane, so beastly, so heartless that they would treat someone like this for no reason, right? Their innocence must be maintained. So he had to do something to bring this upon himself, right? And if you read carefully, you know he's done something. He knocks down an old white woman, right? So I ask you, is knocking down an old white woman cause to be hung, to be burned, to be castrated, and to be disembodied? I think it's a little bit of a disproportionate response to something like that. Also, if you take into account the historical context in the South before the 1960s, right? I can't imagine for the life of me a black man just knocking down a, a, a random white woman on purpose. So I'm led to believe he probably knocked her down on accident, right? But we must maintain their innocence so he had to do something to deserve this. And then... Read two passages quickly. Her eyes were very bright. Her mouth was open. She was more beautiful than he had ever seen her and more strange. He began to feel a joy he had never felt before. He watched the hanging, gleaming body, the most beautiful and terrible object he had ever seen till then. Right. So he's talking about the beauty his mom, he's seen in his mother while she watched this man get hung, burned and dismembered. His father. Well, I told you, his father said, you wasn't never going to forget this picnic. His father's face was full of sweat. His eyes were very peaceful. At that moment, Jesse loved his father more than he had ever loved him. He felt that his father had carried him through a mighty test and had revealed to him a great secret, which would be the key to his life forever. One more time. He felt that his father had carried him through a mighty test and had revealed to him a great secret, which would be the key to his life forever. Right? What Baldwin is doing here is writing white folklore. His mom had never been beautiful. He had never loved his father more than when they shared the experience of watching this black man be hung, burned, and this body dismembered. Then we have this, whatever the fire had left undone. So whatever the fire did not eat up, right? Did not consume the hands and the knives and the stones of the people had accomplished. The head was caved in, one eye was torn out, one ear was hanging, but one had to look carefully to realize this for it was now merely a black charred object on the black charred ground. So historical specificity to this. What would happen when we had these picnics, these social gatherings, these forms of entertainment, those in attendance would get souvenirs. And when the fire would burn out, they would go with their knives and cut a finger, cut a hand, cut a toe, cut a foot, cut a leg. Someone would get the genitals. Someone would get an ear, someone would get a tongue, someone would get an eye. They would take pictures and make those pictures into postcards to show their loved ones how they spent their weekend. There's been studies done that when old homes in the South were sold and they would clear out like the attics in the basement, they would find these old body parts in jars because they preserved them as souvenirs. They would find the postcards of these picnics, right? And then Baldwin closes out the story. Because we know that in the beginning of the story, Jesse can't get erect because of the issues going on in his town as a sheriff that he's forced to put down, right? To put it another way, the restlessness of the city, the power dynamics beginning to erode in the city allowed him not to sleep and not to perform his duties as a man with his wife, right? Which caused him to reflect and cause this song to play in his head. 
I walked to the river at Jordan. The water came to my knees. Why do I know that song? Where did I hear that from? What is that? I know that they're singing it, but the way that they're singing is a little bit different than I remember. I walked to the river at Jordan. The water came to my waist. Where did I hear that? Why do I know that? I walked to the river at Jordan. The water came to my head. Oh, my first lynching. So he goes back to a time where the racial dynamics were more subtle in the sense that black folks knew their place, right? We didn't have to worry about crushing protests and rebellions, right? When a black person act up, we just have a picnic and we put all the other blacks in check. When he begins to think about that type of life, when he thinks, begins to think about the power structures of the town at that point, he gets that little feeling in his stomach that goes down to his genitals that allows him to get that erection to perform his duty, right? So what Baldwin is pointing us to is the connection between sexual desire and power. He says there's a relation at play between those two phenomena. And he wants to point that out to us. So those are my notes. Um, let's jump into our fishbowl. Um, remember, you have to do two a semester. Um, you have one time to pass. You could talk about the notes. You could talk about your breakout room conversation, or you could talk about your journal. Are there any volunteers for our fishbowl? I could go. Okay, Jen Lynn, thank you. Anyone else? I'll go. Uh, sorry, who said that? That's Sebastian. Sebastian, thank you, Sebastian. Well, let's get one more. I can go too. Okay, Nicole. Thank you. So we got Jen Lynn, Sebastian, and Nicole. Whoever wants to start, it's on you. I can start. Okay. Um, I wanted to go back to how you talked about um, in the beginning, how you said that um, the thought of everything that he had um, witnessed in his past wasn't letting him get that erection. Um, towards the end, I thought that was what was, I guess he was getting off on. Like, uh, I thought it was like the cruelty that was like turning him on. I didn't um, think it was um, the power. I thought he was getting off on like, what he remembered seeing and um, the torture and everything just because of like how he described the end like the beauty and all this um just the way he was describing it yeah do do and jillian just not to jump, cut off you sebastian nicole but you're not wrong because it's the um it's the cruelty that insinuates the power Right. And, and they're able to be in power because they're able to go to a level of cure, cruelty that most black folks ain't willing to do. So, so you're not off in that regard. Um, Sebastian or Nicole? Uh, okay. uh, well, to continue what she was saying, um, I was like to try to get more analysis on the reading in general. I looked it up. Um, there is something about like, like inferiority. They saw black people dominating so they didn't like that which was just bringing like um to a quote i saw in the book uh page 236 it's like highlighted they had not been singing black folks into heaven they have been singing white folks into hell so i think that might relate to what you were talking about how he um he was hearing like he was remembering the songs but he doesn't know what they're really saying yeah. what they mean by that yeah and i think if we think back to last week's lecture and I gave this idea about subversion, right? The song is also an example of subversion. They're using these songs to subvert and to, like he said, sing them into hell, right? So that's a very good, good call out, Sebastian. Nicole? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to talk about what I was talking about before, about like the way that um, it's written and stuff. I just like, I don't know why, like it's it's surprising to me when like, I read about like these type of things, especially when it has like a bunch of like violence and like the way that um, Jesse is like the way that he talks about his wife and the way that he talks about the way that he could just simply like you could say like discriminate and stuff, I guess. So I, I don't know, it, it really stood out to me the way that this this reading was different than others because it was more harsh to me and it was more like, 
okay, you need to really take this in and stuff, especially when he talks about how um, when he when he feels the need to just think that it's okay to just say like the N word and stuff like that. So yeah. Um, Jen Lynn posed an interesting question in the chat. Um, she says that I was confused on which women he preferred, right? I'm gonna pose that question to the class. What women is Jesse really more sexually desiring? His wife or or the women that he goes to the other side of town for? What do you think? The other woman. The other woman, I'd why, say. Why? Why do you guys think the other women? He talks about his wife as in like being so vanilla and then uh, the others being like, I think he said like more um, like dirty and all this. I forgot what he said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when he wants to spice things up a little bit, right? He, he'll go to the other side of town and arrest a black woman, right? This is the whole issue with the boy in the cell who he kicks in the face. The reason the boys beef with Jesse is what? Does anybody pick up on that? What that is? What's the real beef between the boy in the jail cell who Jesse kicks in the face? What's that really, really about for the boy? Did anybody pick up on that? Didn't they mention like a lady? Mm-hmm. Yep. Who's the lady? Does anyone know? Old Julia. They know old Julia live here, white man. Right? So what's happening is Jesse, when he used to go to the other side of town and arrest black women. It was either the mother or the grandmother of the boy he kicked in the face. Did y'all catch that? Yeah, his, his grandmother, right? Grandmother, yep, yep. So that's the real tension at play there, right? And Jesse is under the impression at the time that they have no problem with him, right? They would always be cordial and they would say, hi, Mr. Jesse, right? And he would give them some gum. But this particular boy, he remembered he had a problem. Ain't no Julia live here, old man, white man. I don't want nothing from you, white man, right? Yep. So it's a lot layered within this, right? And, and I think what Baldwin is really trying to do, and we'll get to this when we read next week, with all of these things swirling, with all these realities that go into this thing that we call race, how can we get beyond this? How do we leave racism behind when certain people feel that this is the greatest key that will allow them to make it through the rest of their lives? How can we reconcile that? This is what he's trying to get us to think about. This is why he writes this story from the gaze of whiteness, because he's saying, of course, black people are ill impacted by racism, right? The dude being strung up is a black man. But what he's pointing and what he's talking about is how this system of racism also in ill impacts Jesse. Right? Because Jesse's fucked up by this too, whether he's willing to accept it or not. You have to be in a very decrepit mental state to have to think about a lynching in order to be aroused. You're not normal. That shit don't turn me on. You know what I'm saying? That's abnormal, right? So Baldwin is saying this is bad for all of us especially white folks all right is there any other last minute questions comments or concerns um in my great breakout room mm -hmm. i think i mentioned that um there's no resolution to the story like jesse never overcomes like the, the issue of the story is that you know he's racist but he doesn't overcome that and I think it was Jelani that said, like, Baldwin writes that way. Like, his stories are usually, you know, dark. Mm -hmm. um, they have a lot of fear to them. So Not, not too many happy endings, but it's nah. just yeah. grim realities, right? Reality. Yep. So if you, if you, another book, um, another country, another very just dark, 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 grim book. But, and you'll see this next week, there is a lot of beauty in the way that Baldwin writes. And he plays with the dichotomy of the beauty in an ugly world. And you'll see that on full display in next week's reading. Um, and especially the way that he talks about blackness and he writes the details of blackness, the, the contrast of white teeth and black skin, 
white eyelids in the black skin, right? He, he writes this in a way that that's just beautiful. Um, and, and you'll get a, a, a depiction of that next week. Um,